You're listening to the Yoga Medicine Podcast. I'm your host, Katja Bach. This podcast brings you information and resources to enhance the therapeutic effects of your practice based on a deeper understanding of anatomy, physiology, and the integration of modern science and research with traditional practices and experiences. Join me and my co-hosts, Tiffany Cruikshank and Rachel Land, as we dive into all things yoga, research, and wellness. The content of this podcast is not medical advice and is not meant to replace medical care. Please consult your healthcare provider to determine what is best for your unique healthcare needs. So today we have a very special guest on the podcast. If you've listened to this podcast or if you have participated in a yoga medicine training, chances are high that you have heard of this fascia research legend, Dr. Robert Schleip. We're very excited and honored to have you here on the show. It is a pleasure for me, Katja, not only because we have collaborating in the last years with fascia-related research, but also because I know you are a yoga instructor at the same time. So I'm very much looking forward to this uh, conversation. Yeah, and let's people just know what your advances in the field of fascia research look like or what your background is. So your background is in biology and in psychology and your work mainly focuses on the field of connective tissues and um, of the fascial network of the human body. And you have really done so much to advance this whole research field just to give people a couple of examples. You've been the co-initiator of the first fascia research congress. You've been a member of the scientific and organizational organizational committees of all fascia research congresses to date. You're one of the organizers of the Connect Congress. That's the Connective Tissue and Sports Medicine Congress. You are the director of the fascia research group at the University of Ulm, now hosted by the Technical University of Munich here in Germany. And you are a board member of plenty of important research organizations like the Fascia Research Society. So in other words, we've been calling you one of the godfathers of fascia research on here. I hope uh, that is okay for you. <laughs> no, the godfather is not okay, but I admire your brain, how you can memorize so many things. So yoga must be good for one thing. Obviously, it's so good for many things. And today we really um, am so much looking forward to dig into your vast experience and knowledge as it relates to yoga. And why don't we start just with yoga in general? I mean, yoga as a discipline, as you know, is based um, on its ancient Indian roots. And at the same time, knowledge and practices from current research or from current fitness trends have entered the yoga land as well. So we also now find fascial fitness elements or stretching techniques strength practices in yoga classes all around the world. And some people um, emphasize the historical origin of yoga, those Indian root elements, and others um, focus more on this maybe modern perspective and advocate for including those modern health industry trends into our yoga practice. So that's kind of where we are. And I would find it extremely interesting to hear how you think how important these traditional Indian practices are for a healthy yoga practitioner today. Wow. Uh, That reminds me that I have been doing my first yoga practice in puberty when I was in boarding school. I read one of the earliest books, I think from Pramananda, Yogananda, on the origins and on uh, gaining super uh, human uh, cap- capacities. I was holding my breath secretly, was trying to get my legs into a twisted position, probably because I had problems with real reality in my boarding school and with other students and the teachers. So I escaped in my mind to go to for to the further, the more attractive to foreign India. And I, I was thinking I, I would become a yogi at sometime but then later I got interested in girls and other things happened but at that time that was when Maharishi Mahesh Yoga brought uh, for many of the westerners uh, the early ideas of yoga um, uh, to the west 
uh, it, it had very little to do with what yoga has become now, as we have all been witnessing. Now it is more practiced in modern cities uh, by people who work in offices than it is uh, practiced in the country or in other areas that have not been so much affected by modern uh, uh, industrialized lifestyle. So uh, yoga today has not so much to do with uh, Indian roots, and you don't need to know the chakra by Indian names. You don't need to believe in, in karma in order to do yoga. And it has become a very essential way. And our fascial research has been emphasizing that too. So it would be a modern style of multi-articulated uh, stretching. And then you can call it yoga. But actually, I think... Uh, some of the roots would be very interesting. So the uh, contemplative, the meditative attention uh, that has been practiced there or watching your mind. So the meditation can be uncoupled from yoga practice. And many people have been doing that. But that you do them together, this kind of mindful watching, neutral, not performance-oriented uh, attention that you practice there, uh, uh, focused not in a compulsive way, but in a curious way on bodily signals, but also watching what thoughts go through your mind. I think that is a very nice combination. So uh, mindfulness-based uh, uh, meditation practices and uh, doing multi and uh, doing uh, weightlifting, you can also combine, but to combine mindfulness-based meditation practice with these uh, particularly softer and longer held yoga uh, stretching positions is a very unique contribution to our modern lifestyle. But what you said before is very interesting because I thought that most of the yoga positions would be coming from the ancient sutras in India. But now, thanks to more modern research, we know that the majority of the asanas taught today, at least in most of the hatha-oriented or yoga schools, all the standing positions are new inventions coming from the Swedish gymnastics all over the world with Hermann Ling and many others. That was a very healthy uh, response to the industrialization and the monotony on our bodies. So then in the Swedish gymnastics, these healthy ideas they even spread to India and were very successful there. And then in the YMCA movement in India, they took these Western ideas and said, it is better if we frame it into our own culture before we teach it our youth. And that was the reinvention of yoga. And I think that was very, very successful. But now these gymnastic movements come back to the West and we call it yoga. And we forget this was a response to the industrialized age, and these are actually healthy gymnastics movement. So for me, yoga is one wonderful way of doing gymnastics, and they should be combined, and then maybe another question and subject, with uh, some elastic recall motions, and not just with statics positions. So I'll shut up so we can address other topics as well. No, that was actually a perfect introduction. And I have a couple of questions just basing on what you said. Uh, but before I go into those, um, I fully agree. I think we sometimes forget maybe that yoga itself, even if you look at those ancient Indian root elements, has an evolution already behind it or incorporated into it. And it's so nice and that's what yoga medicine is also all about to kind of marry the two together so respect where we're coming from but still enrich and evolve the practices with what we know today because yeah that's what we do there so, so, so you I said think, uh, you, you as a fashion researcher and as a yoga teacher you have one of the most interesting fields because you are honoring the latest research this is where i know more <clears throat> particularly in the field of fascia research which is kind of a new flavor in musculoskeletal Western medicine. But you link that together with these old traditional roots and you take the best of them. So I wouldn't say everything that's 2000 years old is good, but some of the elements are good. And the same thing about the latest research. Definitely. And when you just 
kind of like led us into that topic. You talked about a couple of things that I would like to talk about further. So one thing you mentioned is that those mindfulness or embodied practice elements that we have in our practice are so essential and maybe make yoga unique or special compared to other modalities. And you mentioned uh, like that listening and uh, long held stretches. And obviously that kind of flows into one very popular way to do yoga, yin yoga or also partly into restorative yoga. So all those forms of yoga where you hold the poses for a very long time in a quite passive way, potentially supported by many props. And of course, you're here today because we want to hear all about your expertise on fascia. So what, what's your take on those long-held stretches from a fascial perspective? What, what does that do good in the tissues? Well, this is a new insight, at least for me, that these long-held stretches are, are not only affecting the mechanical mobility in terms of increasing joint range, but they affect also the biochemistry in our body. And uh, particularly for these longer-held positions, one of the major application fields could be chronic inflammations. And that is something that I wouldn't have anticipated 10 years ago, if you hold a stretch, a mild stretch, for several minutes, it has a clear anti-inflammatory effect. And that is very relevant for, for us because most of us, we live much longer than our grandparents uh, did. Uh, so, we, so we live many decades in, in an elder body. And the older we get, at least in terms of biological age, uh, the more we have silent inflammation in our body. And that uh, usually has a non-healthy effect on us. So regular uh, yoga practice can have an anti-inflammatory effect. And uh, uh, that uh, can be very, very much uh, applied in a modern day life. So we all know people who have chronic inflammation and knees that uh, swells up every couple of days or whenever you do uh, 3% more jogging than you should have done. And then suddenly your knee swells up and you have to wait again for weeks uh, when people have that in the ankle or anywhere like that. Then I would say do some yin yoga stretching. And if you don't have the patient, then uh, occupy your mind by whatever, look at some videos. I don't recommend it, but, but try to do it longer than you have been doing it in the past, because at least the research uh, from, <laughs> the, uh, from, from Paul Stanley, oh, from Paul so Stanley. the research from Paul Stanley has shown that uh, three minutes is more than uh, is better in uh, than one minute in terms of wound regulation enhancement, and that also five minutes is better than three minutes. So you could say the longer the better, and that would be one of the unanticipated uh, healthy effects of doing long held position. You can increase not only the anti-inflammatory effect, also anti-fibrotic effect in, if you have adhesions and you want to solve them, but also if you have a wound and you want it to heal more quickly and more completely. Yeah, so that's very good information to have and good to hear. My grandma is currently 94 and running, so we'll see if I do a lot of yoga and many long held stretches, mm -hmm. how, long, how long I can go, yeah. hopefully a long time. Um, yeah, great. So, and, and one other thing that you mentioned as we went into this conversation was um, elastic recoil. So this kind of leads me into the question, do you think a modern yoga practice, which does have strength elements to it, many stretching elements to it, and mindfulness elements to it, does a modern yoga practice include everything that the modern mover needs? Or would you say there are a couple of things that we might want to add to our movement regimen so that our fascial tissues are as happy as they can be? What a great question. Yeah. So first of all, I need to applaud if there is one movement therapy method I know yoga is not movement therapy, it's more than that. Um, uh, that is fairly complete. I, I think yoga is, is very high up there uh, be, because you're not just uh, uh, 
uh, doing one loading, you do multi-articular, uh, long muscular chains, etc. You also have yoga where you activate the muscles and then you have the relaxation there. But your question of what could be still missing pieces in terms of a healthy fostering of the fascial net, then I think, and you pointed that out, li little mini bounces could be explored more. And uh, so that is something that we in the fascial fitness movement, we have been doing that in the last 10, 15 years. We look at the elastic recall capacity. In the past, people thought that was just the stretch shortening cycle. So when you're bouncing, you stimulate more muscle spindles, and then you would have more contractile motor units activated. So, so if you bounce back before you bounce forward, you have more muscle. Uh, activation and that was the explanation why you bounce in the opposite direction before you throw the javelin forward. But now in the fascia research field we have discovered no that has less to do with the muscle activation it is the elastic passive recoil of the collagen tissue and it's collagen type 1 not elastin fiber that has this uh, kinetic storage and recoil capacity. And uh, the more you practice that, the more the parallel fiber connective tissues, the tendons, but also the upper neurosis, but also the IT band, the iliotibial band on the lateral side of the thigh, the more they develop, and you can only see in the microscope, a regular undulation called crimp. Mm -hmm. And the more crimp you have, the more happily you can bounce. So if you practice sports that have more bouncing, and that was shown, for example, in joggers, but not in swimmers, because it's very difficult to bounce in the swimming water. Um, so if you practice more bouncing sports, you become, you get a more elastic recoil and more crimpy collagen in your tissue. And that gives you, so if somebody goes the stairs up and down, who has a lot of elastic recoil capacity in, the, in their collagen, a network, it has a more bouncy, and that is very interesting on a psychological dimension, also a more youthful with TH. So you feel younger than when you have a lot of dampening quality in, in, your, uh, in your connective tissue. And that would be something to include more in yoga practice. Not all the time, and of course, not when you are in a healing condition and when you have acute low back pain, but once you have regained your previous capacity and you want to increase something in your body, not just repair. So in a repair phase, I would not bounce. But if you want to strengthen your body, then I would include mini bounces in the long held position, but sometimes also in the short position, like four or five bounces, wait, and then slowly come back to it. And, and that would be definitely something to include in yoga practice once in a while. But you and I, we can also look at other qualities, how yoga could uh, include more loading that we haven't done, uh, for example, into it. Because it's usually expansive stretches. stretches. How about more compressive positions? Uh, um, having somebody sit on your shoulders and you lift them up. I wouldn't call that yoga, but that would be healthy to do. Uh, so for somebody like me, I should do that at least two, three times a year, have a child sit on my shoulders and I lift them up and I say, I'm strong enough to do that with you. That is not called yoga, that is called functional fitness. But if you don't have that in yoga, then think about doing something additional to yoga. Or maybe think about doing inverted position where you put gravity on your shoulder girdle so you get the same compressive loading. So yes, I think elastic bounces, but maybe also some modified compressive loadings and maybe also other elements of healthy loading. For example, walking for four or five hours has a very different increasing effect on your cardiovascular system than doing yoga for 45 minutes. So I think once a while, every month, you should go on a walk for four or five hours. So your lungs are increasing. And whether you want to include that in your yoga practice or you say yoga is very healthy, but once a while it's good to do something out of yoga, that is maybe a political decision. 
Definitely. And I think some of the things you said have already found their way into the yoga practice, mm -hmm. what la whatever label we want to give them. For instance, people are sometimes trying to do like in down dog, a couple of small yeah. bouncy yeah, yeah. jumps mm -hmm. before mm -hmm. they head up into headstand. Mm -hmm. So a couple of yoga types, I think are consciously or not incorporating this um, already, which I think is perfect. And uh, I also like that you consider yoga to be one of the uh, more complete modalities because I think yeah. I think there's so much in yoga and I also want to believe that there is something in the yoga practice for everyone in general mm -hmm. um, but would you say or do you think that maybe there are certain people or certain conditions uh, where people should be a bit more cautious with yoga or for which or for whom the yoga practice is not a perfect fit For sure. Um, I remember that it's already five, six years ago. I think it started in the New York Times when some leading American yoga gurus were sharing that they discovered when they left away from their yoga practice, one or two of their favorite asanas, they actually had less back pain than before. And then some of their steady Uh, health troubles improved. So then that started a very nice discussion. And I think the yoga community already is more mature than other complementary medicine field for having had that discussion where you ask yourself, we, we don't need to prove always how wonderful yoga can be, but can it also sometimes have an unhealthy effect? under certain conditions and on some people. And that the discussion has started. We haven't had this discussion, for example, in our shared other field that we haven't mentioned in the structural integration community or in other for in manual therapy that you say, under what conditions can it be negative? But that uh, discussion has happened in the yoga scene. And what came out among others is that people who are more on the hypermobile end as to the hypomobile. So people who are um, more joint mobile in terms of how much they can bend their fingers or hyperextend their elbow. And part of that is a genetic constitution. So uh, you see that more in younger girls that they can hyperextend the elbow, then you see it in 60-year-old men, and you also see it in certain Asian regions more. So there's a genetic component that you can call benign or systemic hypermobility, and that makes you be a talented yoga person. And of course, you see these hypermobile women, but it's not only women, but more women than men, you see them more in yoga because they have a lot of admiration and fun. And that, of course, is, is something that many people have pointed attention as you do the sports or activity the most where you have the most fun. And that's usually what you need the least. You should do the sports where you feel incompetent at first and where you are in the last row in terms of admiration, because that would be what your body needs. But of course, people who are mobile, they go into yoga, because then they say, wow, you can do the split. How did you do that? One day I want to be as mobile as you. And uh, that is uh, one of the dangers. So the people who are already mobile, they do not go to weightlifting, which may be better for them. Um, uh, but they go into yoga, so they become even more mobile. And that has been described as one of the dangers. Of course, you can partly avoid that for watching out in these people that they don't hyperextend in the lumbar lordosis too early or too much. But sometimes just doing yoga, where you go in end range position and, and hold the end range position is not what these people need. So, uh, for example, if you have low back pain, that gets worse in resting, where you, where you sleep at night in the morning, it's worse, but as soon as you walk around, it's better. That is not always, but quite often a sign of hypermobility. Or if your low back pain gets worse during pregnancy, when the relaxing hormone is making not the muscle fiber softer, but the collagen fashion tissue softer then the low back pain is associated with hypermobility-associated 
instability, and then yoga practice can have a negative effect on these people. So, so that would be already one of the conditions. Yeah, I fully agree. I just had a baby three months ago, as you know, and mm -hmm. uh, I'm currently breastfeeding and I threw my SI joint out of whack this week. And I haven't had that in forever, but obviously my hormonal state um, and my, my tissues kind of are telling me that they do change, as I know, I should have known better, um, <laughs> when when you breastfeed. And you already also kind of pointed towards the fact that men are not as often um, uh, hypermobile or on that spectrum um, as women. And you mentioned pregnancy, and I just mentioned breastfeeding. So female hormones obviously have an effect on our fascia. It's a topic that is very dear to my heart and that I am absolutely fascinated about and keep learning about uh, all the time these days. And maybe could you talk about that a little bit, how female hormones do have an effect on our fascial tissues? Well, first on the genetic uh, component, uh, we developed this, I think, more than 10 years ago, that on this continuum between people who are more hypermobile on one end and on the others hypomobile, we call them the Viking types, uh, because it's more associated with people whose ancestors came from Northern Europe. So they are more prone for the Vikings disease. That's another name for Dupuytren contracture. And you see that more in men over 60. Every fifth here in Central Europe has this Vikings disease. And uh, you don't see that in women so much. And you don't see it also in men and women who live in Asia or in Africa because they have very little Scandinavian genes. And the same people are also more prone for other fibrotic pathologies that go along with an excess collagen type 1 production, like in Viking's hand or in, in uh, frozen shoulder, for example. But on the other end, you have these temple dancers, because in Indian temple dance, people need to have fingers that can bend more than 90 degrees so they can do the flower movement of my fingers. So if I would be doing temple dance here for three minutes, I don't think it would be, well, you can do it, yes. Yes, so unfortunately. If, if, so if you were a temple dancer, I think you would have many more uh, YouTube visitors than if Robert Schleip does that. Yes. <laughs> so, so that means you have a genetic uh, disposition to that. And um, then the question is within the same uh, disposition, as you mentioned yourself, during your life cycle, how can you influence that? And uh, we know that estrogen has a strong effect on the fibroblasts, and it's influencing more collagen type 3 than type 1. So when, and, that, and I just met Carla Stecco. I will be with her the next week, also in Padua for a whole week, and talk with Katarina Fede that has done some of the research. So Katarina Fede and Carla Stecco, they show uh, when you have enhanced um, uh, estrogen stimulation on the fascial fibroblasts, uh, they produce more the thin collagen type 3 and less of the strong collagen type 1. And also then from Michael Kier's group, we know, I think it was Michael Kier's group, where they reported uh, when you have, and that was Mette Hansen when she worked together with Michael Kier at the University of Copenhagen, uh, that also the collagen fibers um, are less strongly linked with each other under high estrogen with the enzymatic crosslinks. So that is an additional one. But both of them explain that during ovulation and a few days around it, you have a weaker, a softer connective tissue. And that is a very relevant information, for example, in sports. So when you can time your competition or your long run, it, and you have a tendency for knee instability, that's quite common in female runners, you say, I better wait three days after the ovulation, and then I have a much better uh, uh, injury protection. Yeah, but exactly. This is uh, something I really want to learn. For example, about the relaxing hormone, um, how specifically it's affecting collagen type 1 and type 3, 
production and maybe the enzymatic crosslinks. I'm not aware of any detailed research in that direction. Yeah, there's so much more to come in the research articles that you mentioned by Katharina Fede and some of the work of Carla Stecko. We're, of course, um, linking to them in the show notes if you want to dig deeper. We also discussed them a little bit in our um, Yoga for Athletes training. And actually, uh, we are also having a uh, podcast episode about hormones in training. So if you want to dig deeper into that, you can listen to that as well. Yeah, so um, you mentioned that those different genetic dispositions also play a role and that some of us may have a genetic um, predisposition because maybe our ancestor came from warm environments um, versus cold environments. And that just leads me to one of a very popular yoga styles, which is hot yoga. So some people actively go into a very warm steam room or warm room, a heated room to practice yoga. And that must have effects on our fascial tissues and their um, attributes as well, doesn't it? That's very interesting because I spent many weeks together with Professor Werner Klingler in our fascial laboratory then at Ulm University. And I was doing my contraction experiments, how they respond to different uh, biochemical stimulations. And he was at the same time behind me and we were sharing our results to examine how does fascial connective tissue and muscular fibers respond to temperature changes. And what he showed, if you have a collagen or tendon or ligament tissue, the more warm it is, of course, only up to 39 degrees, because you don't want to heat it that you destroy the collagen fibers. But uh, I think he did between 18 degrees Celsius and 38 degrees Celsius. And he showed the warmer it is, the more soft the ligaments and tendon get. And that was not a surprise for me, though I was thinking he's doing useless research behind me. And he probably thought the same thing about me. <laughs> but then he showed me if you free muscle fibers from the fascial envelope, and that is very difficult to do, uh, if you then increase the temperature, they get stronger. So however you stimulate them, whether that is electrically or chemically with caffeine, for example, and you measure how strong they contract, the contraction power gets stronger with 38 degrees than with 28 or with 18 degrees. So that means the muscle under otherwise the same conditions, if you only change the temperature, but you don't change the electrical stimulation or the caffeine stimulation or whatever it is, it will become stronger and therefore stiffer. But the collagen is doing the opposite. And that is very inspiring. So uh, the people who are doing yoga in, in 38 uh, degrees Celsius rooms, it means their muscles are more strong if they want to contract, which can be very beneficial. For example, if you do a headstand, and you realize, oh my God, I'm losing balance. I may be falling over. And you have a split second to react in order to get up to gravity again. Your muscles will be stronger and you can, can protect yourself more potently if your muscles, when they contract, they have a few more grams or kilograms behind them. So in terms of injury protection, that would be beneficial. But if you want to go into passive mobility, it would also mean if your the resistance in stretching was not the muscle fibers, but if the, if the muscle is relaxed when you do a yoga stretch, but the fascial envelope is the stiff thing, then the warmer you are, the more you can go. So it means if I'm doing the split, I'm far away from the split. <laughs> uh, in, a hot, uh, in a hot room, I get 10 degrees more. And it's not because my mind is more relaxed, and it's not because my muscles are softer, but it is because the fascia is softer. But if then my teachers tell me in hot air, there are no limits and you can go beyond your limits, 
then people will injure themselves be, uh, be, uh, before or more than in normal temperature. So I think it's a nice, uh, if people stay the same cautious in, uh, in hot temperature as they would be in normal room temperature, then I would expect less injuries and uh, wider degrees. But if they then have an attitude where they say, I don't need to be careful in hot temperature because in hot temperature, everything is possible. And that has been happening in some of the Bikram and hot air yoga classes. So people, because they feel that the limits are not where they have been before, and then they think there are no limits. And then they injure themselves more than before. But in general, I think it's a very good practice. That's a, so helpful. And uh, thanks for your answer there. And indirectly, you also gave me a reason to actually do drink coffee before my yoga practice. So thanks to Vanna and you for that insight. <laughs> it's very helpful to me personally. Um, yeah, so- but, but you and I, we haven't, at least I haven't done. How about starting? a cold air yoga class sometimes. So what and would that do? <laughs> I don't know at all, but at <laughs> least it would be worth to explore because you are still more stiff than normal. And uh, so for the mental practice, if you do uh, three minutes of doing yoga in the cold, uh, it could be done because you realize in terms of condition pain modulation, that would be something I would like to study. Uh, it has been studied uh, in cold water immersion, which I do regularly. It has been studied with foam rolling. So if you do some mechanical or some challenge to your body, which, which is on the first exposure uncomfortable, but you stay with it, then some descending nerves from the brain down to the body uh, they say this is not so dangerous. And that is a, a very important element. That's something that on first encounter feels threatening. You learn, no, this is actually something I can tolerate. So that would be something you could do not only in cold water immersion, but also in yoga, possibly, that you do it for three minutes in cold air and you learn how to relax your body through a certain relaxing condition pain modulation enhancement in the brain. And then you go in the warm room and then you are rewarded afterwards because you get 30 degrees more and you get the anti-inflammatory effect. But of course that may not be practical. Maybe, maybe if we uh, just plan out a yoga research project in Alaska or in Iceland, that, yeah. could, that could work out. But uh, yeah, I think, the central nervous system, but also generally our nervous system is something that we have discussed on this podcast a lot as well in our yeah. training. So I think all of these effects that modalities such as yoga or also self myofascial release mm -hmm. has on our nervous system from a systemic point of view is just so fascinating. It's not just the local tissues and a stretch. Mm -hmm. What does it do to the area in my arm or in my leg, but to the, yeah. to the whole body, right? Or to the whole system. Yeah. Yeah. So you said that's something you would be. Oh, did you want to add to that? Yeah. So I'm. Uh, please forget my uh, my suggestion. That was the first crazy suggestion to do cold uh, cold air water uh, yoga classes. I don't think that would be very beneficial. But uh, you remind me that uh, if you want to overcome the perception of a fragmented body which is a very interesting dimension of uh, reminding me of the five years of psychology that I studied before I went into fascial research and bodywork, et cetera, uh, that the whole uh, how at home and how connected do I feel with my body in general and also with certain parts of my body. And we know that is a very important dimension. And probably yoga has the most whole body oriented approach. So you're not just searching a single joint, you're not just pushing your legs down on the bicycle, but you would normally feel the energy flow or you feel your whole body over long myofascial chains. And I think that makes it much more potent on this very important 
psychological dimension that you feel like when you go to bed, you are not five different animals fighting with each other and different body pieces that, that don't feel like they fit to the same thing. You don't feel fragmented, you feel whole. And uh, I think that would be one of the very important aspects uh, that would deserve more research. If you do yoga with this more whole body oriented perceptual curiosity, as opposed if you do it like in sports stretching, where you only stretch one joint and you focus with all your attention here and you ignore the rest of your body and you would see how different uh, they may influence the way how you feel afterwards. Absolutely. I fully agree. And I just uh, went on a page actually a couple of days ago of the NIH. So mm -hmm. uh, they had a symposium or an online format where they talked two days about how to um, realize whole body approaches in research, which I found so interesting. So the Very NIH is focusing yeah. on whole body approaches. And mm -hmm. that would be amazing if we could do some yoga related projects on that as well. Yeah, yeah, so you, you suggested a couple of ideas that could be interesting yoga studies that you might be interested in. Mm -hmm. And of course, there's always new research coming out. And I know that you're very much on top of the latest research in fascia. Mm -hmm. So is there anything else or any very recent studies that could relate to the yoga practice or could have applications for the yoga practice that you can think of from the top of your head? What we haven't touched, but I know you have the same curiosity as I have, is uh, the sensory capacities in terms of proprioception and interoception. And uh, the recent Nobel Award that was given for the discovery of two sensory receptors, one of them is very relevant for yoga, the PSO2 receptors, because it has been shown that a high degree of the puberty girls who develop what's called idiopathic scoliosis have a genetic dysfunction on that PSO2 receptors. And if you study their muscle spindles, the muscle spindles are much smaller. And that explains to a high degree why when they close their eyes, uh, they are less precise in reposition error, for example. So the proprioception, how good you can sense where your body is in space, how good you are in symmetry if you do a movement and you close your eyes. And the puberty girls, when they close their eyes, they are less good than other girls of the same age. And so for this area, for scoli anti-scoliosis, anti-scoliosis is a bad word, but for health enhancement, it would be good to do yoga practice that is focused on proprioception. Uh, where, where you teach them open your eyes, close your eyes and feel where your elbow is in space, how much loading you have on the right foot, how much you have on the left foot. So uh, the body in space and the body in gravity, that is proprioception. Uh, and that would be very good to do yoga with an emphasis on proprioception. But if you have people with post-traumatic stress disorder, if you have people with eating disorders, if you have people with uh, compulsive uh, regulation disorders, then we know that the proprioception is not disturbed by much, but the interoception. And then yoga would be as much, if you do the right kind of yoga, in a stimulatory practice, if you focus not where is your knee in space, but do you feel a tingling? Do you feel a streaming? So those more esoteric practitioners who are usually not using scientific orientation, but they talk about chakras and streaming, they could be the best possible yoga instructors if my daughter is in a post-traumatic stress disorder and you want her to recover from that. So I think that would be very interesting to do more research that you design yoga lessons with more interoceptive attention and you design the same yoga lesson but with more curiosity questions about where is your body in space and in gravity 
and you see how different they are affecting proprioceptive enhancement and interoceptive enhancement, and whether my prediction is right, that if you do more proprioceptive uh, accurate stimulatory yoga, I'm, uh, I'm reminded of the basic lessons in Iyengar yoga, they are very precise, which part of your thoracic spine you're extending and which not. <laughs> or if you do more lunar, everything is streaming and the energy and uh, et cetera, that could possibly be much more potent if you have eating disorders, if you have uh, post-traumatic stress disorders, and possibly also fibromyalgia. So that would be a very interesting topic to do research on. So that's a whole area, and I would like to activate my psychologist background again to combine that with the research that you are doing and your colleagues in yoga research. That would be amazing. And for all of those listeners who have never heard about proprioception or interoception or muscle spindles, we have another episode as well, focusing on fascia in that context, of course, highly inspired by your work, Robert. Um, so if you want to dig deeper there, you can head over to that episode as well. Let me add one. I know your time yeah. is running out. No, Another go ahead. Research, we have some more I, time. And I hope to get you is the how important is the mindful attention uh, of uh, the yoga practitioner. And that is something I remember from my psychology studies. And we all know this is part of it, but we don't know whether it's 10% or 90%. And, and many other research have, have done that. So you do a placebo group where you only change how much is, so how the mental context is. And we know, for example, in some areas of medicine, 90% is the expectation and only 10% is the real stuff you do. But in other areas, it's the other way around. And that would be very something very interesting to do. And that would be easy to do, to do a yoga practice and see how it works if the practitioner is this mindful attention, paying attention either to proprioception or to interoception or to both, etc., or if you distract their attention. So you can have them do a yoga position and have them count backwards in numbers of three, starting with 997, 994, 991. So this is usually not stressful to most of them, but you cannot pay much attention to your body at the same time. And you do that practice, so they hold the position, but they count backwards in three. Or you can do it with certain apps where they have to remember things they see on the screen. And then you compare uh, how efficient uh, is the effect of the position. And then you would know how much uh, of the potency is the mindful attention and, 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 and uh, which effects are independent of it. And that would be very interesting. And you may find out, for example, that the interoceptive uh, effects only happen if the mindful attention is in the body, but maybe some of the collagen enhancement effect or the anti-inflammatory effect who knows, maybe uh, independent of the mental attention or the mindful attention of the practitioner. So that would be one of my last studies that I want to do with you. That sounds uh, perfect. And a lot of work that is ahead of us and a lot of stuff that is so interesting to study. Um, we kind of like talked about the nervous system the last couple of minutes. So psychology and mindfulness yeah. in general, but also you pointed a little bit towards the anatomy or physiology of the nervous system. And I know there are a couple of really interesting studies out there that are more um, geared towards or more dealing with the nerves themselves and with our range of motion. Ah, there we Could go. you speak to that a little bit? Ah, okay. So uh, this has been a new topic for me because they found out with ultrasound elastography study. So that's a measurement where in ultrasound, you bring tissues to vibrate and according to how quickly they vibrate, you can make interferences, uh, inferences on how stiff they are, whether they are soft or hard. And this technology is only available since a few years. And they found out in younger people that was average age of 20 years, uh, how much you can dorsiflex your ankle is very much related to how stiff the posterior calf tissues are. 
so the calf muscles and the enveloping fascia. But in older people, how much you can dorsiflex the ankle had very little relationship to how stiff your calf was, but very high uh, correlation to how stiff your sciatic nerve is, 90 centimeters more, cra more cranial, just above the sit bone tuberosity there. And so it is not only how soft the nerve bundle is, but also how well it can slide in the surrounding fascial enveloping tissue. And uh, so uh, older for them was average age of 60. So uh, the older we get, the less important is the local myofascial tissues and the more important are the neurovascular bundles. So far it has only been shown on the sciatic nerve and now other people are trying to replicate it uh, on the brachial plexus and the median nerve, et cetera, how much that's influencing your wrist dorsiflexion, for example. It has not yet been shown, but most people assume it's probably a generalized principle. And then you would say, particularly with older people, look for stretches, but also for mechanical stimulation, maybe for some foam rolling, et cetera, or little tools where you're not doing ironing of broad sheets, but you try to get into the muscular septi. And if I stretch my nerve, it is a more sharp stretch pain than if I stretch my hamstring muscles. And it doesn't feel so nice in the first uh, one or two breathing cycles, but then if you hold the position and you breathe into it, the sharp nerve stretch pain also becomes a pleasant sensation. So that would be something to explore. So we would do different stretches for the hamstrings than we would do for the sciatic nerve. And, and you can do more slump positions where you go forward with your neck or the inverted plow position would be something where you're not so much stretching the hamstrings only, but more the neurovascular bundles surrounding the sciatic nerve. And that would be very interesting uh, to do your yoga anatomy, not only from a muscle perspective, like the best sellers have been done, and not only from broad fashion sheets, as you and I want to do in the next hundred years, where, you, where we look at every yoga asana, which broad fascial sheets are, do you stretch? But in the, and then maybe our children or the next generation, they can look each asana, which neurovascular bundle can potentially be stretched and what slight variation you would do, getting the neck more forward or whatever, doing a tiny external rotation that you are not stretching the whole hamstrings or the whole adductor, but the sciatic nerve or the radial nerve. And that would be very interesting. Absolutely. And then as you just pointed out, like across the lifespan as well, things might change and that makes it more complex. But also I think yeah. with regards to our yoga practice, also so interesting because the yoga practice evolves with you throughout your life. And yeah. many of us know that our practice totally changes, is maybe more physical when we're younger and then brings in those more mindful aspects as we kind of mature with our practice. And then maybe aspects like this play even more of an important role when we when we get older and our tissues change. So I think that's just so interesting about yoga too. It's not, it's not the same, it's not static, but it evolves with our lives as well. Absolutely. Let me do some product enhancement. I, I, I think <laughs> you can see what, what fool I'm making out of myself. So these are the soft cups that are quite popular here in Germany, the biosilicon cupping techniques. And many people in the yoga field now I have been taking these cups that come from naturopathy and from ancient traditional medicine, but that would be something. So if you want to do a sciatic uh, nerve asana, you can put that at the most narrow position on your, your uh, on your sciatic nerve. I'm not showing it to you for obvious reasons. Uh, but if you then do a stretch and you put these cups on two, three places, it is like you had a yoga teacher who you have at home who says, Robert, can I put my finger on the place? I want you to pay attention. 
And this you can never do on Zoom. Actually, one day it will be that there comes a robot arm out of the monitor and touches me exactly during the asana where I can do it. But we are gladly not there yet. But the teacher can say, Robert, do you have one of these Bella Bambi or other biosilicon cups? Put it there. Now put it here. And now do the stretch. Do you feel my artificial finger here? Yes, I can feel it. Now see what happens if you go slightly. What happens to this spot if you turn your eyes? So that would be like a proprioception enhancement touching finger that, that the uh, practitioner can put along their neurovascular bundles, for example, on these more narrow spaces rather than on broad fascial sheets. Yeah, and that's one of the aspects many of the listeners here are yoga teachers and mm -hmm. assisting a yoga pose manually can have so many oh, yeah. levels to it and so many aspects. And that's certainly mm -hmm. one of them if we think about that kind of proprioceptive input that we can yeah. get from that or listening to that input, um, which definitely has its own effect and its own um, line of reasoning behind it. So yeah, and if anyone hasn't watched this on YouTube, please do. Um, I think Robert ma made this very visually clear for us. Thanks for that. That was really a highlight. But you um, mentioned props, so that would be one prop, but mm -hmm. I think it makes sense to have different props. And particularly if you then want to focus with older people, not on broad facial envelopes, which you would prefer with younger people, and they are also nicer. But if you want to focus on more narrow gaps where the neurovascular bundles are, then different props that you can use, like some wooden uh, cylinders you have, little foam rolling pieces, uh, any other props you can use very easily to put more attention, more mechanical stimulation on little individual spots. Yeah, myofascial release balls. Yeah. Or maybe yeah. even smaller. Yeah. 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 Or a structural integration a practitioner, like you have been trained by Tom Myers. I have been teaching at the Rolf Institute. They would come with a human knuckle while the client is doing a yoga position. I used to do that in my studio with yoga teachers. I wouldn't have them all lie on the table. I would say, do some of your daily yoga. I watch you. Now stay there. Can you feel where my thumb is? Breathe into it and together we open it up. But that, of course, is luxury. One-on-one -on -one manual therapy and yoga practice at the same time. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. Thanks for all of that input. Um, as we're coming to an end, I know you have so many projects you're involved with and so many um areas of research you're interested in um, and you keep forwarding the field of fascia research tirelessly um, but what I want to ask you is like what what is inspiring you personally right now like you you have your hands in so many things and you get to know or get to encounter all of those amazing pieces of research be it in the fascia realm or elsewhere what's what's your personal inspiration right now what's fascinating to you Recently, probably yesterday, I would have had another answer, but today it is uh, the whole thing on chanting. So when I did my first yoga lessons in the 70s, <laughs> there was chanting combined, Vare uh, Guru, Om Namo, the chanting. And now the research on nitric oxide stimulation in the nasal cavities is very inspiring. And, uh, and uh, nitric oxide is the gaseous transmitter. And we did some research in our laboratory. It not only makes the arteries more soft, and that is now one of the major new promises of yoga. Yoga. So people who do regular stretching, including yoga, they are less prone for arterial stiffness. And arterial stiffness is the number one health killer. It is not all cancer types together, but what kills more people is heart, uh, heart attacks, uh, strokes, etc. that go along with the arterial stiffness as we age and regular stiffness and uh, regular stretching has a very prominent effect of keeping our arteries young and that is a very appealing effect but the way how it's been explained this very profound effect that was not 
known uh, 10 years ago or even five years ago that regular stretching has a potent effect on the number of health killer in our society, the arterial diseases and the stiffening. And that is explained with nitric oxide. And now the question is, how can you enhance nitric oxide production? We know foam rolling, but also meditation enhances this. But now if you do humming, so if you exhale with a humming sound, with M or NG and a vocal sound before, then your nasal cavities produce 15 times more nitric oxide, not in your intestine uh, systems, uh, but in your respiratory tract. Uh, and in the age of COVID, this is a very beneficial direction. So for me as a scientist, uh, I would have more respect for these non-scientific esoteric practitioners who are just doing ch chanting to heal, to heal themselves mentally and physically. And uh, I think this is very beneficial. And this, of course, is not a new discovery. For me, it's shamefully a new discovery. But in many religions, in many healing practices, people chant softly together at the end of the day. And uh, they think this is for the spirit but it may be a very potent chemical intervention to uh, increase nitric oxide in our body. So that would be something I would like to explore more. So uh, I'm, I'm do now doing gentle humming probably tonight. That's perfect. That's absolutely fascinating. And for me, an amazing example of how the research on all of these topics is just like enriching our understanding, like puzzle pieces, bringing a whole rich, colorful picture together of things that we've been doing forever, but didn't have the reasoning behind it. And it is just so much easier to understand those practices. So we're not inventing anything new, but we're just understanding what the underlying effects are, yeah. which is something I love about the whole field of fascia research. Um, and just, yeah, is, is, is why I love that kind of work and um, that kind of science so much. Is there anything as we come to an end that you would want to add or want to close with? No, otherwise we continue for two more hours. So uh, the answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're right. We could go on forever. So we thank you for your precious time. And if any one of you wants to dig deeper, you could check out some of the latest publications on fascia research. For instance, the second editions to the Tensional Network of the Human Body from the Elsevier Publishing Group or Fascia in Sport and Movement by Handspring Publishing. Those all give you a lot of insights to all the work that Robert has been doing and some of the colleagues that he mentioned today. Um, or you could attend the Fascia Research Congress in Montreal this year held from September 10th to 14th. And uh, of course, we'll link to all of those infos in the show notes. And maybe the two of us are going to meet you there in Montreal. That will be a pleasure as well. Um, so, Robert, thank you again for all of your insights, for um, your practical recommendations, too. It was an absolute pleasure. And I thank you again for coming and in, for talking to us here on the show. Thank you. Thank you very much. And see you in Berlin, where we have the first female whole body fascia plastinate. And I want to do some yoga in front of Raya is her name together with you. See you there. Sounds great. See you there. Thanks for listening to Yoga Medicine. If you like the show, please be sure to subscribe and leave a rating and review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you get something out of this episode, please spread the word and share it with a friend. You can find more information, articles, trainings, and classes at yogamedicine.com or check us out on social media as Yoga Medicine. You can also email us at info at yogamedicine.com. Thank you for being a part of our yoga medicine community. The content of this podcast is not medical advice and is not meant to replace medical care. Please consult your healthcare provider to determine what is best for your unique healthcare needs.